Okay. All right. I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is Monday, April 15th, 2024, the Montgomery County Board of Supervisors special meeting. And we'll start off with our uh, moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. And I'm going to ask Ms. Hill to lead us in both. Please stand as you're able for a moment of silence, and then I'll lead us in the pledge. Let us pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So our first order of business is to go into a work session to talk about the budget. Do I have such a motion? Motion. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Bone? Aye. Mr. Kitts? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Trzykowski? Aye. Mr. Motts? Aye. Mr. Grafsky? Aye. Chair Biggs? Aye. Seven ayes. Okay. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Hill, and she will tell us what we're doing next. Thank you, Chair Biggs. We're going to start the um, work session this evening. Mark is going to come and give a very brief update about what's going on at the, on at the state level. Um, we don't have much news to report from there, so I'll let him share what he's found out. Good Welcome. evening. Um, so, yeah, this, this morning I talked to Vaco a little bit and just give you a little bit update on um, what's happening at the state level. Um, so, as you know, there's a meeting on Wednesday. Um, it starts at noon. Um, and so we were trying to get an idea of, like, what the layout would be and when we would, might have some decisions um, at the state level as far as... Um, you know, different revenue projections on what the governor's uh, adjusted budget will become. Um, and so basically what we know at this point, most likely um, they don't expect at this point that the meeting will conclude and they'll have information before the close of business on Wednesday. Um, and as I talked further, he said, you know, it could go as far as midnight, uh, depending. I followed that up with, you know, okay, what would ha is this like a one-day thing? And generally speaking, it is a one-day thing, but it is possible that they could go into the next day. They could halt the meeting, um, you know, at some point and then resume the following day. But to my understanding and to Vaco's understanding, this has never happened in the past. So more than likely, um, we should have something probably by midnight on Wednesday. Um, after the governor gets the new bill, he has 30 days to sign that. Um, that would be a May 17th deadline. Um, he could wait the entire 30 days and still veto the bill. So um, even if there's a conclusion at the end of Wednesday, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to happen. Um, or he could sign the bill and then um, they would develop a new calculation tool. My understanding as far as how much money we would get from the state they would develop that calculation tool about one week after decisions are made. So um, it could be another week beyond that before we would have a calculation tool to get an exact dollar figure for how much additional state revenue we would get for uh, the schools. 
Um, and there's really no timeline other than in the past, it's been about a week um, after that that we've had a calculation tool. And that's about what I know at this point. Um, uh, they kind of said, you know, hey, things are still up in the air and we will know more once we get to this, this session. And just to clarify for people who might not be familiar, the calc tool is a, it's basically a spreadsheet that, that the state provides to um, the localities and they can put their, the school's ADM in the spreadsheet and then it calculates how much revenue that school district will receive for the following year. So that is the piece of information that's important to know. Sometimes uh, we do get projected amounts before the calc tools available, so we can kind of go on those sometimes, but really we don't know for certain until the calc tool comes out. Okay, so the challenge before us is that we're trying to make decisions without knowing all the pieces of the puzzle, and so um, what we are intending to do at this point in time is to try to get the pieces that we can before next Monday. Next Monday, April 22nd, is probably the last day that we would have to really vote in order to get all the information and the tax tickets out and that kind of thing. So there were a couple of things that came up that, that we're looking at that are going to impact the budget. And then we had some members that had some other questions about the budget. So we want to make sure that all of our members have all of the information and we as a board have all of the information we can possibly get before we have to make our decision. So the decision will be made next Monday, but tonight we're having discussion. So with that being said, um, if board members have questions they would like to pose to us now, we'll try to answer those or we can get back to you uh, later. And we also have a brief presentation for you after we review questions. Okay. So let's start out and see, are there any questions that have come to mind that you would like to talk about tonight? And I guess I can start down with um, Supervisor Grafsky. Do you have, I know you had some concerns. So I uh, thank you, Angie, for getting the, that information back to me this afternoon uh, about the school's carryover. You're uh, welcome. And so uh, that's probably a, a, where that carryover comes from, how it's used, how that factors into the budget. That's probably a Dr. Bragan question for later. Right. <laughs> um, so with that said, yeah, I don't have any other Question Would you like Dr. Bragan to address that? Uh, that would be lovely. If okay, you, Dr. Bragan, could you come up and sort of uh, help us through like the end of the year? And um, I know that some of this all relies on your ADM, not knowing it until I think it's March. But can you walk us through like what that money usually goes for? I think it's off now. Yeah. There. The information that I provided this afternoon was the last three fiscal years undesignated carryover. It did not, I don't think it included purchase orders. It was just undesignated dollars that were carried forward to the next year. And and maybe it, it might help if just to put where my head was at in uh, asking my question to Angie so that it might help you uh, answer the question as well is, you know, so the three year trend on the uh, carryover was between two and a half to two point eight million dollars, um, and so as I understand it, right, you request to have that allocated back, and so is that layered on top of the operating the, the budget that's requested from the county, um, and you know, I guess, is there an opportunity knowing that there's the potential to have these dollars to offset some of you know the future budget requests? if there's gonna be that carry forward? Great, great question. This last year, the, the, the budget year that finished last June 30th, we had under a million dollars in carryover. 900 and change, I forget what it was exactly. I could get you that number though, I don't know exactly. This year, if there was any, if there is any, I'm not sure there will be, what we would wanna do is put that into our insurance reser health insurance reserve account because that's been getting depleted over time. It's not as healthy as the county side and what we would like to have is a healthy reserve of two, three million dollars. As of today, it's around five, six hundred thousand dollars. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but we're counting on some rebates that we're getting back from our 
prescription benefits manager, um, that they projected potentially up to $2 million in rebates that would help us to refund that reserve account. So if at the end of this school year we had, I'm going to make up a number, uh, $500,000, a million dollars in excess after we would uh, accrue all the purchase orders that were open, I would ask your support in that we put that into the reserve account for the health insurance because we want to get that number up to a healthy amount without asking for more monies. I, I don't know if that answers your question, sir. Uh, I mean, yeah, that, that, that helps. And, and so I guess maybe the, so the number well, that we to, saw, it was much different than that. Now, I think you said there's like outstanding purchase orders that that gets netted against. I don't, I don't know. You want to speak to last year's exact number? Mark McGruder. <laughs> <laughs> this is also Mark. <laughs> the, the numbers that were shared with us were okay. significant. Carryover for last year? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, 21, 22, and 23. Last year we had um, two million eight fifty three. Yeah, there were actually three components. Um, there was uh, eight hundred and sixty three thousand that was um, unspent school expenditures and excess revenue. That's about nine hundred thousand. <laughs> okay. There was a roughly a million um, that was uh, unspent expenditures and excess revenue that was put to uh, the health insurance fund, and then there was another million, roughly a million, um, that was unspent expenditures that uh, went to the endowment fund. So the total of that was $2.8 million. The so, endowment, so the endowment fund should not be considered because um, there was an endowment received by the school a few years ago that should have been put into an endowment fund, but it rolled into the operating fund. So when that got pulled out into the correct fund, that was just proper accounting treatment. So really the number we're looking at is about one a million eight fifty three. Okay, but the one million was put into the reserve account as we talked about. Yeah, right. For the health insurance. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's. I could see how that would be very confusing. <laughs> yeah, we just got that top line number. So, all right. Thank you. Um, all right. So while we have Dr. Bregan up here, let's find out: Are there any other questions related to the school budget, Supervisor Bone? Um. Do you have in your budget, since we're talking about the health insurance fund, uh, do you have monies going into that in your present budget? The pres present budget did include a $1.5 million increase in what we believe our claims will be for next year. Mm -hmm. That's not necessary to fund the, um, the health reserve account. That's what our projection from our insurance broker would be on the trend for the 9.9% .9 increase in claims. And um, so in years past, you've put in an extra million dollars, or ha what has been in your budget and what was left over that p you put towards that at the end of the year, over the last several years? Yeah. I can only speak to last year that I'm aware of because I didn't, I'm not sure what we did before that. Uh, we haven't previously put any money specifically into that health insurance fund like we did last year which was just the un unencumbered amounts is what we put in. Previously, we probably, I think the year before, had increased our budget for health insurance costs by about a million. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, anyone else for, Can, yes, back I, I to just want to ask a follow-up. So then, so the reserve account, it, that's, it, I, I assume that's a, a cushion, a stopgap against excess claims or catastrophe or something like I that. I can explain that a little bit. The county is a fiscal agent for the health insurance because we're self-funded self with the yeah. schools. And so we have a separate health insurance fund. Um, when we budget and appropriate premiums, we transfer that, the money into the health insurance fund and then our claims are paid out of it. And our consultants tell us a guideline for how much we need to have as a reserve in that account. So the schools, I think, um, have been making an effort to increase their reserve so that they have an adequate amount since we are self-funded to be able to cover claims as they come due. And I believe in recent times we underfunded that and we're trying to correct for that deficit. Okay. Any other questions for the schools? All right. Thank you very much for being here and for answering the questions we had tonight. Thank you. Okay. And then let's proceed with other questions we might have about the budget. Um, Supervisor Demotz, did you have anything you wanted to bring up? Okay. And um, 
Supervisor Bunn, did you have any other questions concerning the budget? Okay. I just want clarification about um, uh, the presentation that we had in one of the previous meetings about the funding needs for fire. Um, that's not in the budget at all. That's right. We're going to have a presentation about that mm -hmm. following this discussion, but it is not included in the budget mm -hmm. because we didn't real, we didn't know of the need at the time the budget was prepared. And the presentation that will be made, um, is that today? No. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. As part of the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. Budget work session, yes. I have no other questions. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Kitts? Uh, no questions at this time. Okay. Supervisor King? Okay, Vice Chair Fijakowski. I don't have any questions now. Okay, and I don't have any at this time. So I guess we can proceed to the presentation. Yes. Give a little bit of background. Michael Geary is with us okay. again this evening to do a presentation about the uh, paid fi fire. If you remember um, last week, Michael came and gave some information and Vice Chair Fijakowski talked about a need that he was made aware of about um, fire response in the daytime hours in the Shawsville Ellison area. So we got direction from you last week to get some more information and Michael's done that and he's going to present that for you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, good evening, board members. I hope y'all are doing well again tonight. Uh, before I get into the presentation real quick, um, I talked to Angie earlier and I just wanted to give you all an update on the fire from this past weekend. Um, so as you all know, on Saturday, we went out to a fairly large wildfire in the Sugar Grove and Fishers View areas of the county. Um, that fire is now 100% contained by the Department of Forestry. Um, I just want to let you all know of the incredible work that everyone did out there on Saturday. Um, that fire ended up being much bigger than we had anticipated when we first got there and due to the weather and the, the wind conditions, it spread very quickly. Um, but we had folks from across the entire county, uh, Christiansburg, Blacksburg, Elliston, Reiner, um, and then we had Pulaski, Floyd, and the Virginia Department of Forestry out there. Um, and without their efforts, there's no telling how far that fire would have spread, but given everybody's great job, it's contained now. and we can move on. Um, but getting into the presentation a little bit, um, last week I explained to you all kind of the need for this. I don't want to go word for word back through this again because it's the same slide I shared with you last week. But if there are questions about the need for it, I'd be happy to bounce back. Um, but based on the direction that we've received, uh, I want to let you all know kind of what we're proposing and the basis to it. So there are two NFPA standards that we look at when we consider uh, fire response. The first one's NFPA 1710, and the second <coughs> one's NFPA 1720. So NFPA 1710 sets the standard for career fire departments, uh, substantially career fire departments, meaning that a majority of their personnel are career. Um, and, and what it lays out is minimum staffing standards, their objectives, um, and everything that as a fire department you would need to do to be proficient. Um, so 1710, what it says is that if you're responding in a fire truck, you need four people minimum responding to that scene in order to maintain the safety of the personnel and to effectively do the job that they're assigned to do. Um, now there are some caveats to that standard. Uh, that one primarily covers a true fire engine there are multiple types of fire trucks, but that's what that covers. Um, so you may have like a brush truck or something else, for example, that you don't need four people on. But when you look at a true fire engine, there are minimum standards for. Um, the standard that, that really is what we look at for us, because we are more of a combination department, especially as we move in this direction, uh, meaning that we have paid staff and volunteers. 1720, I explained it a little bit last week, but it again outlines kind of those minimum staffing standards and what is viewed as an adequate fire response. So when we talk about Shawsville and Elliston, most of the area down there is going to be considered rural, meaning that you need to have six people on scene within 14 minutes of a fire being dispatched or a fire call being dispatched. Um, and 
the tough part about those communities down there is they are on an island, meaning your help from Christiansburg, Blacksburg, Fort Lewis over in Roanoke County is not getting there for a substantial amount of time. So when we look at this, not only do we want to do what's best for the citizens that are calling 911, but we want to do what's best for our folks, making sure that they don't get hurt before help gets there, because it's going to take them a long time to get down there. So here's our proposal. Um, we're proposing 12 full-time fire personnel broken into two shifts of six firefighters. They'd work 12 hour shifts from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week. Um, like I had mentioned previously, we would primarily staff a true fire engine, but we would also be able to staff a second piece of apparatus. Um, and kind of tying back into that whole safety aspect of our personnel is a fire truck, a normal fire truck carries anywhere from 500 to 1,000 gallons of water. Now, most of the Shawsville and Elliston community is not protected by fire hydrants, meaning that you only have that small amount of water to fight the fire off your first fire engine. So if there was a structure fire or a wildfire like we had this past weekend, we would be calling additional apparatus to bring in more water um, because that's ultimately what's going to put out the fire. So if we, with this proposal, if we were dispatched to a structure fire, we would have a fire engine going as well as a tanker truck and that tanker truck is going to be what brings you the additional water um, our staffing model right now is that we would have one captain and one lieutenant in the station and they would each be responsible for their crew um, the captain would have overall responsibility of the crew's safety and well-being and that lieutenant would really have responsibility over whichever truck that he's assigned to and then you have four firefighters split between whichever trucks that they have to ride. Um, we do have some part-time personnel money in here set aside to fill gaps when we need to meet those minimum staffing levels. If we have somebody out for vacation or sick, um, just so we make sure that we're at that minimum staffing standard. Um, and then the last piece of this is a training position. Uh, we talked quite a bit about this last week. And as this department continues to grow, we really need somebody to not only help train us, but to maintain our records so that we're in compliance with federal, state, local standards. Um, the other caveat of that position and something we had talked about last year is looking at someone that can go out and teach classes, um, not just to career staff, but to volunteers as well. And that was something that the fire chiefs had actually asked for last year, uh, and it just wasn't feasible when we had looked at it. Um, so that position would be able to help both sides career and volunteer. Here's an example of our organizational chart. Um, everything that's highlighted in yellow is going to be what's new. Um, so you'll see our EMS division really is not affected by these changes um, other than having that training person that would help oversee records management. Um, so like I'd mentioned before, you'd have six people on a shift, one captain, one lieutenant, and four firefighters. And Michael, the um, Deputy Chief of Fire and Emergency Management is not a new position. It's just It just has a new title, right? Yes, it a just has a new title. Additional responsibilities. Yeah, so we're going to have to, if this is approved and we move forward with this proposed model, we're going to have to figure out internally how we kind of divvy some of those responsibilities amongst ourselves so that we're not putting too much on one person. Um, but that's our proposed organizational chart if this is the model that we choose to move forward with. And then this last slide here is going to be your proposed cost. Um, so your personnel cost is going to be the biggest at roughly $1.2 million. Um, 1.15 of that is going to be in full-time positions with the additional 47,000 being part-time personnel. Um, a total operating budget, a majority of that's going to be one-time. It is very cost intensive up front because outfitting each individual firefighter costs very close to $21,000. Um, so there is a very heavy upfront cost. And then if we continue on with this, the recurring cost does drop to about 1.3 million year over year um, to cover all of our ongoing costs. So fuel, vehicle maintenance, training, all the things that, that we need every year to continue doing what we're doing. Um, but the total cost for right here right now is $1.7 million. 
as Michael said, um, there is one time, there are one time items listed in this. We could fund those with one time money. We wouldn't have to include that in the upcoming year budget if the board decides to move forward with this. So if we did that, how much money then would be required? If you the subtract that The bottom number, one million three forty five four fifty eight. And the important note here is that this was not included in the proposed advertised budget. This happened after that happened, okay? And um, as we all know, public safety is a number one concern of our board for our citizens. So with that being said, let's see if there are any questions that you all might have about this. Supervisor King, do you have any questions? Yeah, yeah, whoever wants to, okay. How much did you say on turnout gear? So between turnout gear, uniforms, and other PP, it's about $21,000 per person. <laughs> it is very expensive. I hope it. We're going to look, certainly look into those, and we would have, I think that we've already looked a little bit to see how long it takes to get um, turnout gear and that kind of thing and what kind of contracts we can purchase from. Yeah. So we're going to be careful with that as we go forward. Because I can give you a man's number. It's going to be a whole lot cheaper now. Right. <laughs> it, right. So, and I, does that include radios too? And that? <clears throat> that's the turnout gear and uniforms. Yeah, that's turnout gear, uniforms, and then like this past weekend, wildland gear um, and just other personal protective items. Oh, you're talking about wildland gear and everything? Yes. Oh, okay. Everything that somebody's going to wear. I thought you were talking about wear. just structure gear. No, no, no. no. <laughs> that's everything no, no. that somebody's going to wear. <laughs> More than that. <laughs> Because I, I know New York City spends 18500 on their gear. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I don't think ours is, our turnout gear at least is going to be that expensive. Okay. But. okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe I'll go out of order here. Um, since this is all in your district, Vice Chair Fijikowski, do you have like specific questions or comments or things you'd like to tell the board? And then we'll go around for other questions. Yeah. The, the two crews, how would that work on a 12 hour shift? How, how many, in order to cover the whole week, how would that be worked out? How do you mean? The if you got days. two shifts, you got seven days of day uh, shift. I so yeah. it mimics the sheriff's office schedule. So hmm. what you would have, if, if you're on a shift, for example, you're gonna work Monday, Tuesday, you're gonna be off Wednesday, Thursday, and then you're gonna work Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That following week, you're off Monday, Tuesday, you work Wednesday, Thursday, and then you're off the rest of the week. Okay. And um, how many part-time positions would be fielded with that? We're only looking at four, and the reason being is because the, the cost per person is, whether it's full-time or part-time, the cost to outfit them properly is the same. And the part-timers would just be called out when needed? Or they would they be, worked they'd be the included schedule. into the same kind of schedule that we work now where we have full-time medics and EMTs, but if one of them calls out, then we're calling in a part-timer to fill that gap. Okay. So their hours would vary week by week. It's not a, they're not guaranteed a certain number of hours a week. Is that right? It's the part-timers? Yes. No, they would not be guaranteed a set number of hours a week. Well, um, thank you for getting all those numbers for us. Um, they are quite high, but uh, it's uh, something that's uh, unfortunately necessary. Um, you spoke about um, the area down below the mountain being rural. It is very rural, as I'm sure you all found out when you were out there fighting that forest fire. So um, it, it does take time, and we definitely, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to do it the right way right, right from the get-go because uh, uh, there's just too much at stake people's lives so uh, I appreciate you uh, you doing that um, vice chair Fijikowski you might want to since we have people in the audience and also people will be watching this remind them of what's going on during the nighttime how is that working yeah um, the meetings that we've had for the last several months um, we have tried to work it out where uh, the department would be able to cover both daytime and nighttime 
They just do not have the manpower to cover the daytime because that is usually the time when most people work. So they're at work and they, they can't come and answer calls. So um, they have tried various uh, models to try to, to work that out, but it is not, um, it's not safe. The nighttime is a little bit different. They are able to maintain that. So it is, it is the goal to get them to be able to work together. If we have to have paid staff during the day and they can cover the night, then we're in good shape. Um, otherwise, these numbers would definitely be different, so much higher. So, yeah. Um, and Chief Feeble is here again tonight, and I do want to give him credit for putting that together for the nighttime because it has worked really well so far. And you can see the decrease in the amount of time that it takes them to get out of the station to a call at night. Um, and he he really has done a great job leading them. Yeah, and we we want to keep them involved in, in all every bit of this. Um, we want their um, input because uh, we need to make it work. And it's something that I think if you look around at other uh, counties that have gone through this, uh, it, it is a difficult thing to work through, but uh, it can be done. And I'm very hopeful that uh, we will be able to accomplish that and um, get the best coverage that we can. So thanks. Okay. Now let's see if any other board members have any questions for Michael. Um, start Supervisor Bunn. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so I, I think we've always said that we're incredibly grateful for our volunteers and our paid staff. And we know that it's been a little bit bumpy over the last couple of years as we've tried to transition in some paid staff. Um, but I'm a little confused, um, you know, uh, at least for me, you know, I, I believe that, you know, this may be a, re a recurring thing happening um, if the worst were to occur, meaning we, we retain less and less volunteers. So is there a way for us to be a little bit more proactive for something like this, the next one of this, if it ever comes, to give us more of a heads up so that we can include it in our budget or, you know, at we, least be able to manage it a little bit better. Michael and his um, staff do monitor the calls. And as soon as we recognize there's an issue that needs to be brought forward, generally what we do is um, speak to the supervisor in that district and share the information with them. So we do. We do look at that. I think that um, I don't think that staff is in the position to proactively request when there's not a need because we certainly don't want to give the impression that we are trying to take over any sure. of the volunteers for right. sure. So I think we're doing that already. But when things happen, they happen fairly quickly. So we'll continue to monitor that and keep track of it and let you know. And um, we're also getting together information. Uh, Supervisor King asked for some additional information about calls. So we're going to get that sent to you as well about calls throughout the county mm -hmm. and response times. My second question is just, uh, is there any renovation of any of our properties needed to handle this new part full time staff, this new operations? There, um, not right now, right? We could do this as we stand now, but as we talked about last week too, it might involve looking at the future in that area as, to, as far as what's gonna happen with those buildings. Okay, Anything? Okay, Supervisor Kitts. So that, I'd come back to that point because she kind of stole my question. Um, <laughs> so I know we talked about it, we put it on hold. We had one, it's, being, it's planned and we had to wait because this kind of changed the way we're going because it's gonna have to be built differently. Um, and help refresh me on that because I know we said we talked about the plans and and the adjustments but where are we at in that process now that we see this fork we're planning we we're planning and we've been having um the Shawsville EMS station has been in the process of being designed by an A&E firm and um it's those plans are close to being ready to be put out for bid but we um, decided the board decided last week that we should 
push pause on that project and wait and see what happens with this so we can make sure that we do the right thing with the building, that it's in the right location, that it, it includes the right kinds of people, because right now it is just an EMS station. It doesn't have fires in, not included in the station. Um, and I know we looked at the plans and you brought up the director of training to have more training. Are we going to expand our training ability and, and incorporate that into the design? Because I saw the land that we we're talking about putting this on, that we have the opportunity to do this at this time. I'm just... Mm -hmm. The, the nice thing for us right now is we really wouldn't have to. We have really a state-of-the-art training center that exists in Merrimack right now. Um, and ideally, we'd like to be able to do all the trainings that you know this position could possibly do down there and, and utilize what already exists. Okay, thank you. That's all I need. Okay, let me go over here. Supervisor Grafsky, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, and, and pardon my ignorance on this one, but so if we were to... If, if we move forward with this plan and transition to, to the paid staff during the day, does that preclude volunteers from still participating in daytime calls? No. So or does it just complicate? The it is complicated. Okay. Yeah. And I think Marty has probably more insight there from a legal aspect, but we have talked about it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'd have to evaluate what kind of training was needed in that kind of that kind of criteria. So okay. it is something we could look into more, but we don't really have all the answers for that yet. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor DeMoss. Um, just following up a little bit on the Capitol and then I've got another um, unrelated. Can, can you tell me where um, it's been so long since I, I mean, it's been a few years since I've been to the fire station in Elliston. So can you tell me a little bit about where they're currently operating and where the McFIMS EMS is coming from as well? Yeah, so we're all operating in the same station down there. Um, so when we started doing EMS and initially started in that station, we were only doing 12 hour shifts. So when the need was recognized to move to 24 hour shifts, we took over the two bunk rooms that exist down in the Elliston Firehouse for our staff to be able to sleep there at night. And what the folks at Elliston and Chief Ebel have done is they converted another room within the station to make a bunk room that's uh, enough for their folks to stay there at night. Uh, so that's the way it's worked right now. Fortunately, again, with this only being daytime, we don't have to worry about our fire staff sleeping there at night. I don't know if you have more detailed questions about it, but... Um, not really. I'm just trying to um, mentally get my head around the future capital expenditures that are going to become necessary. I just kind of want to prepare mentally for that as well as part of this. Um, unrelated to capital, though, um, I want to talk about um, 81. It's something that has been brought up multiple times on this board um, when we have response calls out to 81, how that ties up our volunteer agencies. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to how having these paid um, firefighters might help with that? Uh, I, I don't have the numbers with me right now, but when after our last meeting, that was one of the questions that we got is how many calls Elliston actually runs on the interstate. So Elliston covers from mile marker 124 over five to mile marker 130, 130 or 131, where it goes into Rhino County. And historically, they've run anywhere between 15 and 25% of their calls on the interstate each year. It was a higher number than I thought, to be honest with you. Um, it, it probably looks like about 50 to 60 calls a year at the end of the day. But as that area does continue to grow and develop, and we look at a Love's truck stop at the 128 and the eventual expansion of the northbound being three lanes, I'm sure that number will increase. And then, um, and this is just due to my lack of, I've never been a firefighter or EMS. So if there's a call, say at 118 or 120, which is not in the jurisdiction for Elliston and Christiansburg isn't responding, would Elliston then be able to respond in this scenario? So there's a pretty elaborate response plan countywide. It, it's a mutual aid plan. So if one department's not available, another department gets dispatched and it, 
it's three deep. So if you have a call on Elliston and Elliston's unavailable, then Christiansburg would come. And if Christiansburg's unavailable, then Blacksburg would come, depending on what area it is down there. Um, so that's pretty redundant. And, and generally speaking, it's not an issue for the fire departments to get out to calls. Um, it's much more difficult on the EMS side because the call volume is so much higher. Mm -hmm. And you can go two, three, four, ten calls at one time, just depending on what's going on. But there are some redundancies there to protect us in the event that someone can't get out. It just increases the time it would take to get there. I appreciate the information and also um, being able to, you know, ask questions specific about that because 81 has long been a safety concern for this board and it sounds like this actually could at least take one little piece of that away. Not, it's not addressing the whole thing, but it sounds like a step in the right direction, so thank you. Michael, just to clarify, you said I think that um, Elliston has responded to about 50 calls on the interstate a year, is that right? Roughly 50 to 60. If, um, but sometimes during the day now they're not able to respond to the calls, but that's the calls that they do respond to, so there are probably actually more calls in on the interstate. Is that right or not? Probably not. Um, even with the calls for service down there, they, they almost always get someone out. Um, there have only been a, a couple calls that I know of where Christiansburg's had to come down, but it, it's very few and far between. When we look at it, it's, it's really, the issue isn't so much no one going, it's how long it takes them to go. Um, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're back down here. Any further questions? All right, Supervisor King. Did I hear you right that volunteers, if this comes in fact, volunteers couldn't run calls during the day? That's more of a legal question, but I... Do you want Marty to address it? Yeah. Okay, Marty, can you speak well, to that? It, I mean, it's legal and training, I think, because we, our, our career people are going to be um, under these um, guidelines, are going to be required to do certain training, um, and, and then currently with the volunteers, we're not sure where they are in training. So I, I think that's what we're, what we're talking about is how those two would mesh and work together. So if the volunteers had the training that um, the county's policy, which is the, what are the, what's the acronym? The yeah. NFPA? Yeah, yeah, you might mm -hmm. want to say what that is so people... It's they're watching the, or in the audience know national national what? fire protection association or agency okay <laughs> so they would just need to have we would have to look at what le level of a training sure. volunteers yeah. would need to have but it's not to say that they it's not prohibited can. it's right. just that 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 that's the big concern is is everyone on the same training yeah so if they volunteer for 20 or 30 years and they go down there and get on a truck if we got paid staff they can't run a call Well, what I'm hearing, right? I'm not saying they can't legally run a call. I, I just think they have. It's one thing we just have to consider from a training perspective: is everyone on the same, on, sa on the same, on the same board? Like, is everyone, like, if they train together, are they ready to work together? I, th I think that's the thought. I think we got a lot of work to do before we even start this. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's why I brought up, and we needed a committee, and we would have known about this ahead of time. If we had a committee, me and, or somebody, two people on this board, you remember I brought it up, mm -hmm. <clears throat> to meet with the volunteers. I'm sorry, I'm just getting frustrated with this. Not with this. I understand we need this. But I always said we need communication with the volunteers. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Vijakowski. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think anybody is arguing the fact that it's going to take a lot of planning. And um, I spoke to the volunteers and told them that very same thing. There's a lot of issues that will have to be ironed out. Um, I don't think anybody can really say um, for certain 
what is going to happen. We have to work through it, and uh, we actually have no choice. This isn't a, an issue of, well, you have a, a firefighter that um, has 20 years of experience in what? In everything? Or in, I mean, what's it going to be? You can, how, you, how do you, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say, and not doing a very good job of it, um, how do you set the standard just because they've been around for 20 years that, that qualifies them? Yeah. I mean, you can pay for staff. You can't buy experience. Well, that may be true, and hopefully that would be considered in everything that we're looking at now as far as getting this thing going. But I, I think we, we, we don't have to get um, too far into the weeds with it. All we need to know is we, we got a lot of issues to work out. And I explained that to them because there are going to be things um, – just like you just had brought up, um, that looks like it's cut and dry, but for whatever reason, whether it's a legal uh, qualify, uh, qualifier or if it's um, a state regulation or federal, all those things have to be considered before you say, yes, they, anybody can ride with them. It, it, you just can't, you can't give a blank statement like that. It, we have to work out all these details, and I think they will be worked out, and I don't think what you're talking about probably would be prohibited. I think it, it'll end up working itself out, but it's really hard for us to say right now what is going to ha exactly happen because we, we got to we got to go through it. And to get back to the um, the station, you know, Elliston Fire Department, we have put we've done some several improvements to the building, improvements that were long, long overdue to try to get it. Um, up to par, um, and uh, I forget, I think we came out with a list of all the things, I think everybody got a copy of that of some months ago, of all the uh, uh, improvements that we've made. But the bottom line is, we don't have any examples in the county to go by. This is brand new, and it's going to take a little bit of uh, thinking through and we're going to have to make the right decisions as far as what is done with the building. If the building is uh, good enough to, to keep this going the way it is with daytime paid and, and nighttime um, volunteers, then we're in good shape because we've already invested some in the building. But if something were to go south and we lose our volunteers at night, then what you're talking about is a combination station. I don't know if that facility is going to be uh, set up for it. Definitely, the new rescue squad is not going to be set up for that. Um, they had plans of uh, leaving a, um, a fire engine at the uh, new facility, um, like we have in the past when we had uh, Shawsville Rescue there. We, we had uh, an engine there, which helped with response times. But we won't have that anymore if we don't have volunteers. So it's... These, all these things have got to be considered, and that's why I said at the last meeting we need to put a pause on that building because we may need that capital money to either make improvements to Elliston building or we may have to build a, a complete new facility in another location. Um, if any of you have ever visited that station, it sits in an area right next to the river. Um, it, it was... Uh, material was brought in to elevate that building, um, which is going to probably, as, as far as the engineering aspect, and I'm certainly not an engineer, but it just goes to, to say if you're going to build up on it or out on it, there are going to be uh, a lot of considerations, and it may not work out. But now, again, I'm throwing out something that we have no idea if it'll ever happen. Um, but it's good for us to talk about these things. Because if it does happen, we're going to have to react to it. Okay. Anyone else want to say anything else about this? Okay, Supervisor Bone. So what I understand is that this plan, this, this budget that you're presenting, is to address a current need that we have. But really, this is going to start up July 1st. Is that correct? 
we don't have an exact timeline for it. It's really dependent. The The issue that, that we're going to have is it, it takes time to get all of the, the gear in that we would need to be able to do this. And turnout gear is anywhere from three to six months right now. And we'd have to have that before we send folks on a fire truck. Um, and we have to have them here to measure them for it first too. So it, I don't want to give an exact timeline because it's really up in the air right now, but we will try and address this as quickly as we can, but it will take time. Mm -hmm. So my, my expectation is that the numbers that you've presented tonight are for a full year as if we started July 1st. Is that correct? That's correct. Which we won't probably because of the gear lead time and stuff like that. So the number that our fiscal year 25 will experience will be something less than this, but 26, the total recurring should be approximately $1.3 million. Is that correct? That's correct. We talked about prorating the amount, but like Michael said, we don't know when it will start. And if things go very smoothly, it might start in July. Maybe that would be hard, but maybe. Um, so we didn't want to, to prorate it at this point. So at this point in time, we somebody's covering down there and it's your three deep coverage that's covering down there, right? Um, but when this is fully up and going, you have to work out how can you involve the volunteers in with the professional staff? It just will take some time. Is that what we're talking about right here? That was part of the discussion, uh -huh. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Supervisor Kitts. So I've got a question for you, and I don't know if the Chief's going to be able to answer this, but how many of the volunteers, because you said you got to get everything sized, you got to get the equipment reissued, how many of the volunteers are interested in going full-time? They would be able to incorporate the pride in the community, the local knowledge, and to be able to bring the experience in under the umbrella of, of a single department to be able to incorporate that. Yeah, Chief Evil probably knows best, but we do know that there are quite a few that have already reached out. Come on up. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Uh, my name is Mark Ebel. I'm the whoa. I am the volunteer chief at Elliston. Been there since August. Been a member since about. Well, I've been doing emergency services for 31 years. Um, to answer your question, we have approximately 26 on staff um, as volunteers. We have uh, the biggest core of the guys who do all the work. I would say in the neighborhood of 12 to 15. Um, we cover roughly 92 square miles. Um, we go from Roanoke County line on Bradshaw, uh, up Allegheny. We go uh, bottom in the middle part of the uh, 460 up to Christiansburg, and then we go about to the 120. And we also go towards Blacksburg um, in the Ellet area on the far side of Den Hill. Um, the, the balancing act we find, and, and I mentioned this in the meeting we had about 120 days ago, is if you were to pin our station on, say, Google Maps, and then you were to pin the addresses of our volunteers, it's pretty tough to make the time restraint or time expectations um, of the national standards. Um, we're doing as much as we can with the resources we can. I will tell you that the crew has done an excellent job in recognizing the situation we're in. They're making the good faith effort to try. We're trying. The reality is that the numbers are the numbers. And we're not by ourselves. You know, if you talk to other departments in the area, even the, the towns are going to be suffering. And if you go to the bigger areas, uh, Roanoke County, Roanoke City, Salem. If you look at the higher populated areas, they are also struggling on the hiring side and the retaining side. Um, so, in as much as um, it's a, uh, I don't want to call it a sad day for our volunteer department, it's not 1957 either. Right? That's when it started. Um, I was questioned at one point. Um, and you had 28 people, how many people were doing the work? I said 12, 15 or something like that. And I said, the guys used to fall over each other to get on the trucks back in the day. And I said, they're all gone. They're all dead. It's a, it's a 
change of culture that we and everybody else are struggling to get with. And um, we started looking at these numbers prior to the contact from the county. And we quickly saw that there was an issue. And then about 24 hours later, I got a call. Can you come up and visit? So um, we're not uh, ignoring that we're being very proactive with regard to this topic. We, f we feel that your generosity in the past has been exemplary in terms of board support with our projects and our engines and all our gear. Um, we have some of the best gear you can ask for. And we will try to work within the parameters given from the county. Um, there's a couple of cautions I have with regard to the design and setup of this uh, new organization or sub-department, however you want to state it. Um, and we'll get into that later as we go along, but you know, I don't believe this will be a quick thing. I, I would, my observation is that July would be, um, that would be tough. Just to even go through the hiring process and vetting is going to be a tough process. So I would not, I would not say July. I've made the comment to my crew that I would not say for a year before you really have um, people parking in the parking lot to come in and work. There's a lot going on. So I hope that answered your question. I kind of stort went around the corner on that. Yeah, I just want to be able to, because I want to, my, my grandfather retired firefighter from yeah. Run Oak, so it's yeah. near and dear to my heart. Sure. I want to make sure that we bring the people in that have the experience, like Todd said, that have the local knowledge, that have been doing the calls, that want to be able to do it on a full-time basis, and it helps us also offset, be able to bring, because they already have their equipment. They're already in size. Yeah. They already yeah, have yeah. the area. So. so I've got, in the ballpark, I've got, say, three of my guys who have expressed the strong interest in hiring on with the county. So there's, okay, there's a truck for a day. I also have been approached by several people in other counties, uh, Arona County for one, um, who've expressed curiosity, all right? I'm, I'm not gonna commit them to anything, but um, they're curious as to, you know, what's gonna happen, how are you gonna do it, and all that kind of stuff. So I can't answer because, well, they don't know either. Well, thank you for what you do. I greatly appreciate yeah. it, and everybody on the board. Our pleasure, does, yeah. Thank you. Okay, all right, anything else I can help? Okay. Anything else down here? Over here? Supervisor DeMott. I'll just point out if, if and when, because I think that it's admirable and wonderful if we're able to recruit volunteers to full time, we have less staff to work overnight and more need for full time staff. Um, I feel like I'm very doomsday tonight with the questions that I'm asking and saying <laughs> this as well. Uh, I, I'm more just planning. My mind immediately starts going down the path of how to plan for this to be the most successful possible. And I think um, if we are able to recruit volunteers into full-time positions, which is wonderful, then we have a nighttime problem. We're playing uh, whack-a-mole a little bit. Okay. Anything else? Um, well, I noticed in the paper today that Amherst County is having the same problem. They're trying to, to decide how they're gonna handle it also. But what I wanna say on behalf of the board is number one, thank you for the response this weekend. Um, thank, um, thank the other localities for helping out. Uh, the other thing, I, I noticed the fire, I was talking to Supervisor King, I think Supervisor DeMotz, I saw a fire today on 114. And there were the fire engines there, the amb I mean, and, you know, you looked at the folks sitting on the ground. I think that was their home. So it's just critical that we have the services and the response time for our citizens. And I think we're all on the same page with that. So thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you. Thank all you. right. Um, let's go back to the budget. Are there any other budget questions that have come to mind. So we sort of have an, we have an item here that wasn't included in the original budget. So we're all aware of that now. Is there anything that you would like to ask now about anything else? Okay. All right, so basically what we're going to do, I guess we'll try to 
get our heads wrapped around everything and any new information that comes that a board member has asked for, Ms. Hill will send out to everyone and then we'll plan on um, voting on April 22nd and keep our fingers crossed that we'll know something from the state. Well, I think um, the frustration lies that we're, you know, the school board does their job, we do our job, and then our general assembly members did go down and do their job this time, but now it's the coming together of the general assembly members and the governor and what's gonna happen. And it would be nice if we could sort of know what we were getting from the state, especially in regards to schools. That, that helps us a lot. So is there any other business that needs to come before the board? We need to go to work session. Okay. Let's leave work session, and who would like to make that motion? Second. Okay, and roll call. Mr. Kitts? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Fitzikowski? Aye. Ms. DeMotz? Aye. Mr. Grafsky? Aye. Ms. Spohn? Aye. Chair Biggs? Aye. Seven ayes. And with that, we're <coughs> officially adjourned till Monday.